you know, US and Chinese forces. And so I think um, making sure that there's a clear understanding of how uh, the rules of the road should work in air and maritime encounters is useful. Um, and I think that's something you see, uh, you know, of course, Japan is interested in that too. And so for, for other countries, um, uh, that's, that's going to be a concern. Uh, and then I think, you know, making sure that our Chinese counterparts understand that the, uh, you know, the U.S., um, even as the relative uh, gap in power between the two countries gets smaller, which is, you know, probably inevitably going to be the case, um, that we can still uh, have a, you know, level of military capability uh, in, the, in the region or that can be sent to the region as needed. Uh, that is more than enough to protect our interests and to uh, stand with our allies and partners, and that they're going to uh, react by kind of counterbalancing in their own right to um, develop their own capabilities, uh, work more closely with the U.S., and also work more closely with each other. Um, that that's going to be uh, you know, kind of a natural response to uh, more Chinese power and more of China's uh, you know, kind of exercise of its power. Thank you. I'm going to move down to Ian Easton, who's a research fellow with the Project 2049 Institute and author of the recently published book, The Chinese Invasion Threat, Taiwan's Defense, and American Strategy in Asia. Um, Ian, I wonder if you could dive in a little bit about how these air routes perhaps might complicate Taiwan's defense planning, or what, what are the implications for, for Taiwan's MND when they, when they look at these air routes and when it comes to, to the defense of Taiwan and their security needs? Well, first of all, very good afternoon to you all, and thank you to Rachel for the kind introduction. Uh, now, as we've heard, this is a political military problem. So there's a political backdrop to it, there are the political ramifications to it, and then there are the military, the national security uh, elements at play here uh, as well. Now, first, to talk about the political piece just a little bit more before talking about the national security elements. Two years ago in Taiwan, there was a remarkable shift in terms of domestic politics, where the KMT was voted out of office, and not just out of the presidential office, but also out of the LY, Taiwan's Congress. And it was a landslide shift in Taiwan, politically speaking. And there was a sense that something had changed there. Something really significant had changed, and clearly China's strategy or its policy for dealing with Taiwan had failed that Beijing's Taiwan policy had failed because they had gotten the exact opposite of what they'd been hoping for and trying to get for a very long time. And there was a sense, I think, in many corners that this would give Beijing pause, that they would reflect on where they had gone wrong, they would reflect on where Taiwan public opinion had shifted, why it had changed, and then we might see a softening of their approach to Taiwan. What we've seen is the exact opposite. We've seen this, this steady ramp up of intimidation tactics and coercion against Taiwan. And it's remarkable because it was the coercion against Taiwan under the KMT government that was one of the factors that, uh, from the very get-go, made the KMT unpopular. Because here we had Ta Taiwan for eight years showing a tremendous amount of goodwill for the mainland, making this investment, with the expectation that there would be a return on that investment, that China would show goodwill in return. And of course, that didn't happen. And when that didn't happen, uh, for that reason and for other reasons, the KMT became very unpopular. Well, now what we've seen is China actually double down on what was, in fact, essentially a failed policy. That instead of adjusting the course and correcting the course and the approach to Taiwan, they've gone full speed ahead in terms of coercion. So instead of softening the approach, correcting the mistakes they had made, they doubled down. Now that has very real implications, because the more they do that, the more they rely on coercion and intimidation, the more likely it is that Taiwanese public opinion will continue to harden. The same thing has happened in Washington, DC where most people, most foreign policy experts were two years ago on the US-China relationship is very different than where it is now. If you read our new national security strategy and the new national defense strategy, we're in a very different place than we were just two years ago in terms of our approach and our view as a nation to China. And a big part of that is based on Chinese behavior, Chinese actions, right? Nothing has changed fundamentally in terms of China's political scene. The Chinese Communist Party is still the same party, the same leadership that was in 
in place a year or two ago, what has changed is the actions, the behavior, and the sense of disappointment that we're expressing goodwill, we're showing goodwill through military to military channels and diplomatic channels and economic channels um, in every way we possibly can. And this is what we get. This is what we get in return. What we get is economic warfare. What we get is psychological warfare, media warfare, and legal warfare. What we get is bombers circling Taiwan now, and intelligence gathering aircraft. What we get is the use of civilians, basically militarizing, weaponizing civilians. Because if you look at the air route, the, M the M503, that runs right through the middle of the Taiwan Strait. Now a safe air route, if you're charting air routes, and you want to keep your passengers safe, you stick close to the coast. Because the Taiwan Strait, these are very dangerous waters. You're talking about an average of sea state five or six, especially this time of year in January, February. You're talking about very foul sea conditions. So if a plane does have to ditch, the probability of survival for the crew is extremely low if you're in the middle of the Taiwan Strait. Now, if you're right along the coast, which is where you would rationally put an air route, then you can, you can have a lot of options there. You have a lot of time to get to an airfield that's very close by. And so from that perspective, this is highly problematic, that we're now seeing this use of civilian aircraft for this purpose, to double down. Now, what is the defensive or the national security implications for Taiwan? What is the stress? that this might be intended to put on the ROC Air Force, the Taiwanese Air Force. Well, one of the issues is that Taiwan's Air Force is aging, that Taiwan has been trying to recapitalize its Air Force for a decade now, with very little success, because the US has been freezing arms sales and withholding arms sales uh, in this particular area, the sale of, of new fighters, whether they're UF-16s uh, or, uh, in the future, perhaps F-35s. And so now we have these airframes that are out there, and they're under stress because they have to be on strip alert, and so out there 24-7 with very heavy fuel tanks on the wings, so they have the extra fuel, so they have more loiter time, and they have more speed when they're out there intercepting to identify aircraft that are approaching their ADIS, and they're out there all the time. And they're taking off and landing. We've seen this with the Japanese. The stress is put on the Japanese Air Self Defense Force to have to constantly be responding to acts of what are essentially uh, coercion in the air. That takes a toll on an airframe. Of course, it takes toll on the pilots. And we have some F 16 pilots here from Taiwan in the audience. So, and you can talk to them um, maybe after this is over about what that does when you're constantly on edge, when you're constantly on alert, and what that does to your fighter aircraft. Especially in light of the recent crash of the Mirage. Especially in light of years of F-5s crashing. Now Taiwan needs new fighter aircraft, and it's not clear if and when they'll be able to get them. And so there's a stress that, that's put uh, in this regard. There's also a stress because these new air routes run right up against restricted airspace that the Taiwanese Air Force uses to train. So there's several training ranges. They're giant boxes on the map. They're restricted keep-out zones. And these air routes run right up alongside them. It's incredibly close to these giant boxes, these restricted areas on the map. And so the potential for intelligence to be lost or collected if indeed some of those civilian airliners have, if they're not what they appear to be, and there's somebody on board listening or watching from there because they're very close. There's also the issue of the proximity to Taiwan's outer islands. If you look at where these routes run and their proximity to Dongyi, which is Taiwan's northernmost control uh, outer island, which is vital for the defense of Taiwan, especially in a crisis, let alone in, a, in an invasion scenario. And Matsu, and then south, you have Uchouyu and Jinma. Now, one of the concerns, if you go out to Jinma, if you go out to these islands, what you'll see is in open fields, 
you have these pikes that are in place. And the reason they're there is because there's a concern that one day there could be a surprise attack and that you could have paratroopers suddenly dropping onto these islands. And so you have these counter um, airborne landing obstacles that are put into place. So we're talking here not just about a political dispute between two normal countries in a normal situation where it's just a matter of sovereignty, like in the South China Sea. It's just a matter of how, how exactly do we draw the line and how do we deal with, you know, who gets the resources. <coughs> what we're talking about is one country that has a declared policy of annexing or conquering, or if needs be, invading the other country. And the implication there, of course, is that could lead to great power war between the world's two most powerful countries. So this is a very, very sensitive place. This flashpoint is unique. There's nothing else like it. And so when you look at all the individual components that are at play, the political components, the geography of it, the risk to civilians, the reduced warning time that the Taiwanese military now, had, now has, if there is indeed one day a period of high tension and there's a concern that the Chinese may launch a surprise attack, all of these are very important factors and they certainly deserve uh, close consideration. And I think where this takes us now is into a long, potentially drawn out war of nerves. And I think in many ways we're already there, that now there is this war of nerves that's playing out across the Taiwan Strait. And the implications of that potentially are very serious. And so this is something that is very worth uh, discussing and I look forward to to Dan's uh, remarks on um, where we go from here. Thank you. I think, it, to me, it's important that you know the outer islands because where, where Matsu and Yushoyu and, and Jimin lie within um, what is established by ICAO is Shanghai's um, flight information region. And ICAO has, has I think they've, like, they have, they, let me think about what I'm trying to say here. So all of these outer islands rest within Shanghai's flight information region, and that is assigned by ICAO. And I think it's notable that, to my opinion, what I've seen, I haven't seen ICAO come out with any type of statement or anything about these new civil aviation routes. In fact, I think on February 5th, or maybe it was February 8th, um, Beijing hosted ICAO for the 2018 APAC Ministerial Conference where um, the Secretary General of ICAO um, you know, thanked China for, for their efforts in, in you know, aviation safety and, 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 and whatnot. So I think it's also like worth noting kind of where, where, these outer, where these outer islands lie within China's um, airspace and then what, what does that mean for, for those islands and for Taiwan's early warning. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, moving on to Dan Blumenthal, who's Director of Asian Studies and Resident Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, um, where he focuses on East Asian security issues and Sino-American relations. Also former commissioner of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission from 2006-2012. Um, so kind of being, being the last one on the panel and hearing um, everyone's thoughts, kind of can you, how, how do we take all of this information and, and digest it and, and where do we go from here? Sure. Um, how, how many of you here uh, serve on congressional staff or, or um, serve in some capacity? <coughs> yeah, so uh, we will get to certain things that we can do and, and quickly that we can press the State Department to do. Um, but uh, I, had, I, I put together sort of a word, a word salad that I'll get to each one of them. Uh, uh, they may not all sound like they are consistent, but I wrote down um, empire, economic trouble, politically fractious, uh, ethnic riots, sunflower movement in Tsai, Josh Wong, and U.S. Taiwan responses. Let me put that all together for you. Uh, it's impolite to say, but it is extremely important to remember that not only is Xi Jinping running, uh, you know, a Leninist party. And, and a lot of what he does is, 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 is shaped by that. 
uh, a lot of what he does in terms of party to party relations that he would rather have with Taiwan than government to government relations um, uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, the definitions that they make about um, you know, different stages of development and so forth are still extremely blandness, but it's also extremely important and very impolitic to remind everybody that China is foremost an empire, that the last hope that it has reunified all the empire from the Qing dynasty except for Taiwan and Hong Kong those are the last holdouts. And so when Xi Jinping makes speeches about national rejuvenation and the China dream and so forth, when he refers to separatist movements and so forth, he is very afraid that this empire will split. Um, it, and if you look at what he's doing in Xinjiang and Tibet, turning them into the, I guess, the, the highest tech police states that the world has ever seen in some ways, uh, it's extremely connected to Taiwan. And he believes, both from the perspective of uh, securing his place in the CCP's historical legacy as well as what his legacy will be that Taiwan and Hong Kong are uh, going to be the legacy in terms of completing the full reunification of the boundaries of the Qing Empire, with it, except for outer Mongolia, which will have to wait another time. But it's, it's, it's just extremely important to remember that we're not dealing with a country in that sense. We're dealing with a Leninist empire. And, and he does make references all the time to ethnic separatism. Remember, he, he came to power uh, after some of the worst riots in Xinjiang and Tibet that we've seen in, in 20, 30 years. And he conflates Taiwan with that, and now he conflates Josh Wong and Hong Kong with that. And his efforts to suppress democracy in Hong Kong are of a piece with, uh, with what he's trying to accomplish with Taiwan. In his view, it is. Uh, he, he even will say that Mao, he's not going to make the mistake of Mao Zedong, who entered into the Korean War and, and lost Taiwan. And, and there's a real connection geopolitically there between his thinking vis-a-vis -vis Korea and his thinking vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Um, but you know, he, in that sense, is really is really going for it in terms of course coercion uh, on Taiwan. Uh, now, part of that is. He is insecure at home, and China is facing enormous economic headwinds. I'm not one of those who, who think that China is acting more aggressively only because it has more power. I'm fairly convinced that it's acting more aggressively because it sees it sees a path towards economic stagnation. You know, much much like Vladimir Putin, and it has to rest its legitimacy now on being the vehicle that unifies China and returns it to national rejuvenation, which means you know, back to its one-time glory. Uh, uh, not, not firmly defined, but I think most countries in the region have some sense of what that means, uh, in, including Taiwan. Um, I think, as was mentioned before, he, he views uh, Hu Jintao's approach and his early approach uh, as failures. Um, but uh, to Ian's point, I think failures in being too soft on Taiwan, not on being too hard on Taiwan. So a lot of uh, you know the the openings and the economic framework agreement and the air links and all the rest of it, he criticizes as being too soft and encouraging separatist movements. And uh, we have to also remember that that China makes lots of mistakes, both in its assessments and its Activity. So if he assesses that that was the wrong move, um, and, the, and the only thing left is coercion, you know, it could be it could be a big miscalculation on his part. But that depends on us. It doesn't depend on IKO. It doesn't depend on WHO. It depends on the United States. And it depends on Taiwan. They will push and push until they meet resistance, and they haven't yet met resistance. So um, just to take a couple of, of uh, you know, the, the, the overall coercion campaign is multidimensional. It started as soon as Tsai was elected. Um, I have a colleague at, at AI, Philip Lohaus, who 
tracked the amount of times um, size on Facebook and other social media were just practically hacked to death the minute that she was inaugurated, uh, as well as most other Taiwan leaders and so forth. Uh, there's been some very good work on media campaigns, whether it's buying Taiwan media or other types of, I mean, I'm not that, I'm not that concerned because Taiwan has such a, um, you know, open, freewheeling media uh, um, environment, but, you know, the attempts at least to buy and control more Taiwan media in Taiwan, uh, you know, to get TRC's message out. And the basic message, the basic message to Taiwan and to all of Asia, and unfortunately it's one that the West is eating up, um, is, is it's over for you, that the United States is done and, and, oh, you know, and, and over time we're the hegemon and you better make a deal. And we're eating it up in the West. I mean, we're just eating it up. I mean, there's not a major newspaper or magazine, you know, in, in America now that doesn't have, um, you know, some story about how China is the leader in globalization. I mean, just ridiculous. I mean, you know, they, they can't even, you know, they, can, they can't even open up their own private sector. And they're, you know, but we're, we're just eating it up, and, and, um, uh, and, and China knows this. Um, so the coercion campaign has been multidimensional. Um, it's been personal uh, attacks, uh, cyber and otherwise, on the, on the current Taiwan leadership. It's been media buys, it's been attempts at economic punishments um, that you know, don't work so well, but uh, boycotts of certain imports by Taiwan, the reeling back of tourism and so forth, which was in the end uh, somewhat of an economic benefit to Taiwan, obviously. It's the targeting of certain businessmen and the few business in China. It's the diplomatic truce being over and the amount of particularly Latin American countries uh, that have been uh, turned back to China. By the way, I don't understand why that's not more of a U.S. security concern. I mean, Panama, you know, I believe my view of U.S. history is that we fought hard to make sure that Panama was never in hostile hands, and uh, uh, it just baffles me sometimes. Of course the Chinese want some presence, irrespective of of sticking it to Taiwan, I want some presence in the U.S. backyard. <coughs> it's, it's an answer to the U.S. being present in, in China's backyard. So uh, the coercion campaign has been, as was mentioned before, now with this uh, civil aviation uh, move, which of course the Chinese people I forget promised that AKO not to do, that they would not do that a year ago, and. Uh, uh, and and uh, and on and on, and of course the, the you know the military pressure campaigns, including what Michael Chase said, uh, these moves uh, you know through the Bashi Canal and, and <clears throat> the demonstration to Taiwan and to others that they can go and operate anywhere, anytime, uh, you know, followed with this information campaign to the Asians that you know it's only a matter of time before it's over for you. Um, so this is part and parcel. Uh, coercive air campaigns are extremely important. Uh, of course, the Chinese would rather not uh, take Taiwan by ground. You know, most countries want to be able to say that they can do missile and air campaigns and cyber warfare and not lose anyone. I don't think that's going to be possible, particularly if we posture ourselves in certain ways. Um, but this has been a multi-dimensional, multi-year uh, coercion campaign that began as soon as Tsai Ing-wen uh, was elected. Uh, and it's unrelenting, and unless you live and work in Taiwan and Taiwan's government, uh, you can't feel the pressure that they feel every single day. Um, so, uh, now is it working? I mean, um, you know, I, I agree with Mark completely. Over time, I think what they do when it, with respect to the South China Sea, the, the, the Aedas in Japan, yeah, you get, you just kind of get used to the new normal, as we say. I mean, I don't think five years ago we would all be just used to the fact that the South China Sea was completely militarized. You know, I would say, nah, that, that would never happen. I mean, we would never allow that. But, uh, um, but, uh, 
that's not, uh, but, but it's happening, right? Or uh, an aid is, or the kind of pressure that Japan's under uh, almost daily uh, with respect to the Senkakus. Uh, that's happening. You know, we always say this will never happen. I mean, it's happening. Uh, or the latest moves right now, and, you know, that everyone predicts that there'll be some sort of aid is over the South China Sea as well. And, and so, I mean, you know, from the Chinese perspective, it's not a question of contested sovereignty or negotiation. It's sovereign territory. I mean, they, they say it in the Chinese writings constantly. I went through 150 different sheet speeches translated for me, and, you know, it's, it's a constant statement that, that the South China Sea, Taiwan, all these are, they, they're Chinese territory. They're protecting Chinese territory. And so I don't, you know, that, it's very hard to negotiate against these kinds of claims. Right? The, the only thing you can do is to start to push back in every dimension. Now we have said, as, as, Ian, as Ian said, we are at a point where um, we have a national security strategy and, and, and other documents that call explicitly for competing more vigorously with, with, with China. We call them a revisionist power with whom we will engage in strategic competition. Uh, and uh, and the question is how to do that. I think you know. I think militarily, there's been some good news recently in terms of U.S. resources. You know, it'll take time to employ them and appropriate them, and all these things you do here in Congress that are opaque to everyone else. Uh, but at least there's some positive movement in reversing some of our our slide and defense posture, which is I think. Probably at the end of the day, the most important thing uh, is 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 to have a robust robust defense posture that can actually meet the missions that the Secretary of Defense and the Pacific Commander say that they have. Um, but then it really comes to the State Department, and uh, and when you say you have a competitive strategy in all domains, in the information domain becoming one of the most important, as Mark alluded to, both here in the United States. And, and elsewhere, I mean, the fact that, that we don't have a strategic information um, capacity anymore is, 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 is boring on malpractice, you know, and, and uh, that's certainly something that Congress can ask about every time they, you know, meet with their counterparts at the State Department. I mean, you know, this isn't too hard. I think somebody alluded to that movie, Mike Chase and I were talking yesterday. It isn't too hard to point out internationally on a constant basis that China is breaking rules all the time, right? And then accusing us of accusing us of, of violating one China policy. I mean, that's not too difficult. You know, the, the the propaganda and so forth only works if there's a kernel of truth to it, and and, and China has lots of kernels of truth uh, that they're providing us. It isn't too hard to convince other Asian nations that. That what China is doing to, to, in Taiwan in terms of coercion and and um, violating what we now call the rules-based order. I don't like that term. China has a lot of rules. I like the free world. I don't know where that went. Um, but uh, but anyway, we use the term. You know, it isn't too hard to convince the rest of Asia that that what's happening in Taiwan will happen to them soon. Ta you know, Taiwan is the canary in the coal mine. Should this continue? Um, so I mean, I would say that. Yeah, defense budget is extremely important, but but public diplomacy, information campaigns, uh, identifying Chinese information campaigns would be a high number two. I don't think the State Department is in any way organized for that sort of thing. You know, I, I, I don't even think they're looking to organize for that sort of thing. You can't really do it anywhere else, and, and, and you know, so I would call strongly upon. Uh, people dealing with Asia or elsewhere in the State Department to ensure that they have a robust capacity and strategy for counting, for countering these kinds of information campaigns. That's where China is being effective, I think, in the, in the information domain. I think, as 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 um, Ian was mentioning, and I was thinking to myself, like, you know, there's been the arms sales package to Taiwan and so forth. The Chinese have just made the greatest argument for more uh, Taiwan uh, fighter aircraft, and I bet that will happen, you know, actually. So in that sense, China's counterproductive half the time. But, you know, you can be counterproductive 
and still win a lot if you don't really have a concerted effort to push back in every in every.